Good evening, everybody, um, and uh, welcome to our um, second um, of these Bible studies um, through this season of Lent. Um, and a particular welcome with a different hat on this week uh, to Archdeacon Vanessa. Vanessa was with us last week as a participant, um, and uh, this week is going to be leading uh, the Bible Reflections. Um, so thank you to her for all the work she's done putting material together. Um, and good to see some of you, good to see many of you who've come back after last week. Um, so that's also uh, really encouraging. Uh, one or two people are continuing to drop in, um, but we will continue um, uh, to gather. And first of all, we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this season of Lent and for the pilgrimage that we share together, reflecting on scripture, on your generosity, and the call to each of us to be generous disciples. Open our hearts and minds to hear your word afresh. Be with Vanessa as she speaks to us. Be with us in our groups as we talk and learn and listen and help us to be equipped that we may continue to strive to be generous disciples, faithful in this season of Lent. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you, over to Archdeacon Vanessa. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you for your welcome. Um, it's been really good to uh, uh, do the preparation for this. It's it's actually a passage of scripture that I love very, very much indeed. In fact, I'll uh, let you into a secret. The very first sermon I ever preached, which must be getting on for 40 years ago, was actually on uh, Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. So um, this passage has been part of my life for quite a long time. But as you know, our focus for reflection this evening is generous disciples. And uh, last week, Bishop Peter invited us to think about the generosity of God, an abundant generosity full of love and played out in the life, death and resurrection of his son Jesus for the sake of the world. And at the end of our session last week, Bishop Peter offered these words. Discipleship is not about passing on exterior information, rather it is about modelling inner transformation. I'll read that again. Discipleship is not about passing on exterior information, Rather, it's about modelling inner transformation. So this evening, we're going to take that idea further and ask ourselves what that inner transformation might be about and what it might mean for our own generosity as rabbinic disciples and for our stewardship of the gifts God's given us. So let's hear this evening's passage. Romans 11. O oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Or who has given a gift to him, to receive a gift in return? For from him, and through him, and to him, are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. <laughs> 
For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministering the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Thank you, Chris. And I'm going to invite um, Tom, if he would, to uh, put the, the slides, to screen share the slides as I speak. Uh, and we'll need to move on to, uh, I think it's about slide seven. So that's the quote. Okay. So the letter to the Romans is sometimes considered one of the more difficult of the New Testament texts to handle. It's loaded with doctrine and sometimes thought to be light on application. Indeed, Paul spends the first 11 chapters of his 16 chapter letter laying out the perilous state of humanity and the salvation which God in Christ offers the world. These chapters contain some of the most loved purple passages in the Bible. Verses like these, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Or I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul leaves his readers in no doubt that God loves them. And more importantly, that God's salvation is for the whole of humanity and not just for the Jews. But he also leaves them in no doubt that this has implications for them as Jesus' disciples in their inner life, in their attitudes and in their actions as well. So let's look more closely at this passage and ponder what it is Paul's saying. The first thing that Paul makes clear is it's all about God. It's all about God. We move on to the next slide, please. Verses 33 to 36 of chapter 11 are the crowning glory of those first 11 chapters. In an outburst of praise and worship, Paul underlines that the initiative of grace is always God's. Quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, we are reminded, for who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Or who has given a gift to him to receive a gift in return? There is nothing we can do to make God love us. There's nothing we can give him that will prompt a repayment. For from him, and through him and to him are all things. This is the starting point for any generosity that Jesus' disciples might offer. It's all about God. And it's all about our response to his love for us 
made known in Jesus. That's why we can never persuade people to be generous. We can only demonstrate God's love for them by the way we live and pray that their hearts too may melt into generosity as the Holy Spirit touches their lives with God's grace. And it's true for us as well. Our giving, be it of money or time or gifts, must flow from a heart that's deeply in love with Jesus Christ and that simply has to give in return. So to become a generous disciple is not an act of the will, but an act of love. Ultimately, it's a spiritual matter, not a material one. It's not about how much can I afford, although that is a responsible question to ask. Rather, it's a case of how much do I love God and my neighbour? And what's the response of my heart to the love that God has already shown me? Our generosity will always be in proportion to our love. If we love someone a lot, we want to give them gifts to express that love. So it is with God. And nurturing that loving relationship is so important if love is to be sustained. So the first thing Paul says is, it's all about God. And generous disciples know that. So let's move on to the next slide. The second thing Paul suggests is that it's all about attitude and action. It's all about attitude and action. And by attitude, he means more than what people think of one another. He's referring to that deep inner transformation by the spirit, which will affect every expression of who we are as disciples of Jesus. Let, remind, let me remind you of those words Bishop Peter left us with last week. Discipleship is not about passing on exterior information. Rather, it's about modelling inner transformation. And Paul speaks of that inner transformation in the first two verses of chapter 12. He says this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Chapter 11 ended with the worship of words. Chapter 12 begins with the worship of our lives. Indeed, the remainder of Paul's letter is the practical outworking, if you like, of the doctrine which he has so painstakingly taught and elucidated in chapters 1 to 11. And the worship of our lives requires inner change by the mercies of God. We could take several Bible studies to unpack just these two verses from Romans 12. But what I want to do is to just point out a few particular words or phrases. So the first of those in verse one is that little word, therefore. It may be to state the obvious, but this is the word that links us with all that's gone before. It's only because of what God has already done that this inner transformation of Jesus' disciples can take place at all. It's only because of what he's already done that they have any hope of becoming generous in their attitudes and actions towards one another. Second, there's that perhaps slightly disturbing phrase, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. What does Paul mean? And what might this mean for us as generous disciples? Well, 
sacrifice would of course have been a far more familiar activity in first century Rome than it is in 21st century Essex and East London. In Jewish, Greek and Roman culture, the sacrifice of animals in the worship of God or the gods would have been relatively commonplace. But that's what makes Paul's injunction so powerful. Animal sacrifices would have rendered the victim dead, good only for consumption as food. The kind of sacrifice of which Paul speaks of here is different. This is a living sacrifice, a self-offering, which is not an end in itself, but which is offered not just to please God, but to change the world. We can move on to the next slide. We recognize this every time we pray that prayer at the end of the Common Worship Holy Communion service. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. This prayer in normal times prayed every week by so many of us acknowledges that the once only sacrifice of Jesus, the efficacy of which we participate in every time we receive bread and wine, that sacrifice of Jesus is the means of grace by which we are able to offer ourselves in his service in mission to the world. In other words, we can only offer ourselves as a living sacrifice because Jesus has first offered himself as the once only sacrifice through which we're reconciled to God. And it's that word living that makes all the difference. For this is our true worship. It's not just about what we do in church or on Zoom week by week. It's all about attitude and action. God has been generous to us and calls us to be generous to others in return. But it doesn't come naturally, does it? And that's where our next word from these two verses is so important. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. We can have the next slide, please. Be transformed. There are two things to note here. The verb is in what we call the passive voice. The transformation is done to us. It's the work of the spirit. It's not something we can do for ourselves, although we can indeed must be willing to offer ourselves to be worked upon. God gives us the freedom to resist his grace if we want to, but we'll never become generous disciples if we do. But secondly, the Greek word used for be transformed is the same word that's used to describe the transfiguration of Jesus, that story which we heard just a few weeks ago on the Sunday before Lent. We are to be changed for what lies ahead in a similar way to the way that Jesus was changed on that holy mountain. Not that our clothes will become dazzling white, but that people may see us differently and may glimpse in us as we go about our daily living, something of the holiness and glory of God. It's this kind of inner transformation that we must seek, for it will change our lives and our attitudes and our actions, and will help us to become generous disciples. So how does all this work out? Well, it makes us generous towards others, not just by giving money, but by being moved with love for them. It makes us generous towards others by being willing to recognize our own failings and being forgiving towards the failings of others. It makes us generous towards others in encouraging them and longing to see the best in them when we might so often be tempted to criticize and complain. And it makes us generous in the offering of our time our gifts and our talents in the service of the kingdom. 
It's all about God. It's all about attitude and action. And then thirdly and finally, it's all about relationships and service. Next slide, please. In verses four to eight of chapter 12, Paul talks about body image. It's a picture he develops more extensively in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Here, he summarizes the same image by reminding the Romans that they are in relationship, each different from the other, each dependent upon the other. Yet they're one body in Christ. More than that, they're all gifted in different ways and they're all needed in different ways. And they need to be generous towards one another in using their gifts if the body is to function effectively. Generous relationships require the generous attitudes about which I've already spoken. And they require generous service as well. Whether we are prophets or ministers or teachers or preachers, those who give materially or those who lead or care for others. We're called to serve in God's church and in God's kingdom. And we all have something to give. And please note these roles or tasks which Paul names are not officers in the church. They're not licensed or authorized or ordained. They are ordinary disciples who have known themselves loved by God and who are being transformed by the renewing of their minds, their attitudes, and their actions in service. Paul goes on to say more in the verses which follow our reading about how all this plays out in the life of the community of believers. He speaks of love, goodness, affection, showing honour, empathy, harmonious living, meekness, genuineness, and more. In short, he speaks of the fruit of the spirit blossoming and growing within the church and shaping their service of those amongst whom they live. Generous disciples are signs of the kingdom and agents of God's love for humankind. They know in their hearts that it's all about God and their lives exemplify generous attitudes, generous actions, generous relationships and generous service. We cannot do it on our own, but we can offer ourselves and allow the Spirit of God to transform us from within. And when we do, we will indeed change the world. We now have the opportunity to spend some time in the groups and I think a couple of slides further on uh, are the questions if, if Tom wants to put those up, but I think you have circulated them as all as well, haven't you? I think it's the one after that. Sorry, they're a bit small on the screen, but hopefully you can see them. Um, could they go into the chat as well if people haven't got the questions available? So um, the first thing is really just to, to reflect on whether a particular word or phrase stood out for you from the reading uh, and to reflect on why that might have been. Uh, then there's a question, if generosity springs from the heart, how can we encourage one another so that giving becomes response rather than duty? Then in your experience, what gets in the way of generous attitudes and actions? Can you think of an example of this in your church community? Tell the group about someone you've known personally, or it could be a national or international figure in whom you've seen something of that inner transformation by God. How have they changed? And if you want to talk about your own experience there, that's fine. And then finally, what gifts can you offer in service of the kingdom and how might you share them more generously with others? Don't feel you have to do all the questions, but uh, hopefully there's something there that you might enjoy speaking about. Thank you. Welcome back everybody from the breakout groups. Um, we sent 21 people into breakout groups and 21 people have come back. So that's extremely good news. We haven't lost anybody uh, in cyberspace. Um, we're now going to hear again uh, that passage from the letter to the Romans. Uh, and just to let you know that at the end of the passage, um, there's going to be time for reflection 
Um, and that will be a time when we're going to hear some music which will come over your computers. So don't worry, uh, you haven't switched channel. That's all part of the, the, the plan for this evening. And just to remind you that like last week, if any questions or queries or comments emerge, uh, please do drop them into the chat um, and we'll use those as the basis for the plenary session that will follow on um, after the music. So let's just keep a moment of stillness um, as we prepare to hear that scripture again. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Or who has given a gift to him to receive a gift in return? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. So as we continue to uh, reflect on um, our discussions, the chat is now open. Um, and if you want to deposit in your chat um, any of the questions or comments or insights that came out of your group, um, that would be really helpful because we could share those and um, also share them with Vanessa and hear her reactions. But maybe as we're waiting for some of those to drop in, Vanessa, do you want to tell us something about that music and what led you to choose it? Um, I think I knew that I wanted to use this prayer of St Ignatius. I mean, I, I could have written to a, a prayer for us to use during the coming week, but um, I, I've, uh, I've sort of followed Ignatian spirituality for many, many years. And, and so this prayer is particularly familiar to me. Uh, and I just sort of felt that it would be helpful to use it um, uh, to reflect on, on what I hope I've been trying to say, which is actually it's all about it's all about God. Uh, and in a sense, what, what we can give is only our response to what God has already done. Um, and it seems to me that Ignatius sums that up you know, very effectively in, in this prayer from 400 years ago in a way that I couldn't do any better. So <laughs> um, that's why I chose it. And I just thought the music worked, worked well. I was trying to work out where it was, where the, the, the filming is. I think it's somewhere in South America, but um, I'm, not, I'm not absolutely sure of that. Any comments coming into the chat? Or did you all have such complete conversations that there's nothing else to be said on the subject? <laughs> 
which is entirely fine if that's the case. A uh, comment from uh, uh, Dave Chesney. It's a response to God's grace rather than to a worship service or a good sermon. Presumably, Dave means that being a generous disciple is a response to God's grace. Is, is that... Yeah, I think sometimes when we talk about generosity and giving, it's uh, we 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 can treat it as a transaction. Yeah, and, uh, we we talked about the idea of uh, responding to um, maybe getting caught up in the moment in worship or whatever. And interestingly, and this is only financial giving on, on, a, on a time of a church service, but interestingly, the offer tree is near the end of, of a worship service rather than at the beginning. Um, those churches that have them uh, and uh, you know I've preached before on the, all the P's of generosity and one of them is priority the idea of actually we give because we've already been given um, regardless of what happens at church or whatever it, it, it's, it's a constant thing um, so, rather, rather than a transactional thing every time maybe we come to worship yeah and, and I think one of the things that really struck me preparing for this is, is that 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 fact that we cannot persuade people to give that's that's not how it happens <laughs> um what we can do is actually witness and and witness the love of god to them uh but the transformation has to come from within by the spirit so that doesn't mean we don't we don't witness to them but it, it i think we can beat ourselves up if people don't give uh and that's that's just a false alley i think I love that passage in Romans 12, um, you know, the bit about the living sacrifice. But I, I once heard, and I've used it ever since in sermons, I've preached on that passage and on uh, generous giving. Um, the problem with the living sacrifice, as, as Vanessa said, you know, they were dealing with dead sacrifices, but we are living sacrifices. The problem of living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. <laughs> And, you know, I think that's that's us, really, because giving generous giving is sacrificial. But how much, you know, do we crawl away off the altar of it at times? Because it hurts. Exactly. It's meant to. Hurt. Yeah. A couple of more comments have dropped into the chat. All right. That's uh, written uh, for me. The phrase, the words that came from me in the passage is I appeal to me is I appeal to you. Um, Lee and Teresa have said, we said that just as we are starting to lose hope regarding finances, something generally happens to ease the problem. Um, and another comment, faith and action is necessary where giving is not enough. The good sermon will help us to understand faith and action. I think what that draws out is is that we give in a whole variety of ways um that that generous disciples it, it is about the whole of life it's not it's not just about finance it's about every interaction every relationship every uh every attitude that we express or don't express that's part of whether or not we're being generous disciples Thank you. And now we move to our final prayer. Um, Vanessa. So as we go into the week ahead, uh, we just uh, draw together that sense. It's all about God. We can choose whether to respond or not. But this prayer perhaps sums up our hope and our desire. Let's pray. <clears throat> 
Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all that I have and possess. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it as you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you to uh, Vanessa um, for guiding us through this evening's scriptures. Uh, to uh, Tom for controlling the IT so beautifully and carefully. Uh, but most especially to each of you for giving the time to be uh, with us um, this evening as we continue to journey through the scriptures uh, in this season of Lent. Uh, next week, uh, we have a, um, another face, a new face uh, joining us. Uh, Bishop John um, will be speaking to us uh, next Sunday. Um, and do please register for that if you haven't already done so. Um, uh, uh, information's on the Darsen website. Uh, you may well get an email in the coming days reminding you of the, uh, the registration um, in case you haven't done so uh, yet. But thank you all very much for this evening, and, uh, and I hope that you have a very uh, holy and peaceful week uh, until next Sunday. Thank you very much. <laughs>